Gonna have a few days break before the winter comes and I might even get a few fish, who knows. But this morning, normally I walk down to this gate and look and see what the sea looks like. I can barely see the horse and foal over there. Thick foal. But Mark Cannon, who runs the operation with Trish, here at the uh, at the wood point. B&B establishment I have managed to sort me out one of the guys down I think his name is Taylor down on the quay and um, see if we can't pick up the elusive silver bass one thing over here it is so quiet this is Woodpoint point B&B I love makes me want to go to Mexico when I see that bell up there like that because you can see what it's like Lovely courtyard, got all the B&B &B here. Got a variety of rooms as well. So you could do, don't have to be boat fishing, can be shore as well. This was uh, one of my abodes for the night. Generally, it's in the car. We're going fishing, me and you. Me and you are going fishing. So you got en suites as well. I thought I'd just give you a whiz through so you get an idea. You're here for that sort of thing, fishing. And of course, great food from Trish. Well, I've come down to pier. I can't be waiting with all this water here. But this is Cormac Pier. You've got Mark with his uh, shop here, look. Oh, 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 well, who can that be? That's Mike with a really big um, common skate, quarter board, high sea drifter. We towed it all the way over here. Had a great trip. And of course, there in Mark's shop, you can get your tackle and stuff like that. You've got a boat slip, a launch down there as well. Got to watch a weed and something. Here's the actual Cormac Sherry Pier. Mark's down there putting a pump on there. That's Sean on there with him. Normally low tide I don't fish here. The tide's dropping away. Have you done much pollock fishing out here? Smaller than that much. Yeah. I wonder if this coloured water actually pushes them out, you know, the pollock, or, yeah. or whether they stay here or what, who knows. Definitely the most coloured I've seen it. I think I did have a take there, I think I've got one small fish. Right on the bottom that was. 
Might be a small pollock. It is indeed. There we go, put him that way against the sun. Small pollock which we'll keep, luckily, fell off inside the boat. Hey, <laughs> that was lucky. That can be perhaps a nice conger bait, but a nice little fish. Yeah, small one on here, I think. I don't think it's a mackerel. Oh, nothing. It's come off. Come off. Oh, that. Probably a bloody great piece of weed. Have you any kicks at all? So I guess it's a lump of weed. It's a dead weight. Piece of weed, I'd say. I'll settle for a fish if it is a fish, but. Yeah. Oh, strange things happen at sea. Well, that was right in the kelp, that one. There we go. Thank you, Lord, for that. A nice pollock. You can see where he's just grabbed at the lure, not actually got the lure. He's missed the lure and just hooked in the edge there. That's a nice pollock. There you can go back. Got me in the kelp then. I see he's about the same size as the other one. We've got a bit of a different drift this time too. We're a little bit further out, aren't we? A bit further away from the rock. This time he's got the uh, got the feather there. Don't want to fatigue, no. There he goes. Well, we just tried trolling with a sidewinder lure. I don't think the boat was in gear, what, 10 seconds was it? Yeah. And this is definitely a better size fish, 100%. And that's still quite close to the uh, reef, aren't we? Yeah. This is a good fish. I was lucky to get him out of the kelp though. Here he comes. Oh yes, that one to do. See how close I was to the kelp. Yeah. <laughs> I was in it. Yeah. You can grab him if you you can swing him over if you like. I think it'll be alright. If he comes off, he comes off, no sweat. We got I've got a net, but good man. Well I wonder if it's what do you think? State of the tide? Yeah, what? probably. Not my skill then. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely fish. Well that is worth waiting for. Let's see if it works again. Yeah, if we don't want him, we'll put him back, eh? Yeah, do you want to Yeah, shoot him in. He's gone. Well, we're on again, we tried the same uh, move. Just going back in towards the rock. I can actually feel the fish banging at it this time. I think it's a smaller one. Or oh, smaller than the last one, but you can never tell. Let's have a look at that. It's nice, 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 still a good fish. He's a bit smaller. There you go, he's a bit smaller. Look at that, absolutely suck that lure straight back. Well, I think we get a second, second rod rigged up. Could be changing the game. Secret method, Taylor, don't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice fish. Good man. Draw him back? Yeah, put him back if you don't want him. October sunshine, that's a rarity, really. It's like early, early September, really. I'm going to go a bit deeper.
We burned through our lures. We've got one shad left on Taylor's, and I just put a spinner on this one so I can't go mad on it. Just to see if there's any mackerel there, and I'd say it's a pollock. If it's not a pollock, it's a very big mackerel. Got to be another pollock. Here he comes. He must have. Yeah, he's got it. He, so the method you can see is with the boom, the lead, and trolling, even with the spinner. Now I'll turn him around for you. I don't want to get all over the camera lens. There you go. Nice fish. If I can get the hook out, even better. I just dropped the spinner down again, boys, and uh, it was away. So I've got another fish hooked up here. When I saw the river all flooded like that, coloured, I wasn't really hopeful, I have to say. But it's hard to believe that. Just one change of technique makes a difference. This feels a better fish. Well, we've got the boat in gear, but... Oh, you're on? Yeah. Oh, double header. Guys, there you go. And that's through leaving the... You know I said leave the boat in gear? You might get a fish. Yeah. It's still towing the rubber eel. So it's always a chance. It's only slow, so... All the time it's in slow forward, it's got a chance of moving the tail of the fish. This doesn't feel a bad one. Oh, look at this. So you think we're not telling porky pies? You swing him in there, Taylor, we can show him. There you go. Oh, oh sorry about that. Sorry <laughs> about that, Taylor. You know, it's the way it is, isn't it? <laughs> Seniority rules. Good bit of fishing though, isn't it? Here we go, guys, both back together. Another two fish, double hook up again. Both sides. It's a bigger one, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's a bad fish, isn't it? Yeah. Nice one. So possibly the reason for the sudden turnaround of success is it fish on, is he? No, back. In the bottom. It's the fact the brown from the flood out of the river is all there and the salt water from the fresh of the flood coming is here. And I don't fancy fishing in that, so we're getting all the fish on this side, the fresh seawater. fishing out there, I'll tell you what, that wasn't a bad old session really, was it? Beats the heck out of sitting waiting for three, three or four pin whiting off a of South Coast beach. I know, well worth the travel. Anyway, what you guys, sorry? The gap? Oh the gap, oh the gap here. Oh the gap down there, where that giant big marlin rod and reel was. Yeah, they're missing, they're missing aren't they? Makes you wonder what I was doing with them, doesn't it? Better keep watching for future films. You never know what's going to come up. Anyway, what you guys wanted some information on how to catch fish like that. Now, some of you are going to go, oh, no, all about that. Oh, oh, yeah, it's a French boom, running rig, blah, blah, blah. Same old thing we use. But no, it is the same. It's the different technique that made the success there. OK, so I'm going to make a rig up and show you what they're like in close up. And hopefully you'll get the gist of how I caught those fish.
Now, there's two lures that I use for that. I'm calling it deep trolling. That is the regular, regular sand hill regular, but they do a weighted and an unweighted version, and a sidewinder lure, which is weighted for casting or for general sea fishing. I'll show you what they look like. Okay, first one up is a sidewinder, as you can see. <clears throat> they're different colours, different sizes. The one with the uh, blue head there, just up the top there, actually has the weight in the top of the head. Um, they're all weighted internally, and at the bottom is a red gill with a weight inside that you won't actually see until you pick it up. Trust me, the weight is in there, and generally the hook comes out the opposite direction on an unweighted one to a weighted one. Over here on the right, we have the standard red gill imitation sand hill. Um, different sizes as well, don't be uh, frightened of using the small sizes there, for sure. Um, they also, you know, can be different colours, you can see black, one of my favourites is black, absolutely no question of that. Additional tackle you need are some plastic uh, beads, a couple of swivels that I'm going to use different sizes, and just for showing the film two different size weights, and a sharpening stone and some fishing line which I carefully place upside down so nobody can accuse me of flogging fishing line and ramming tackle. Plastic booms, you can use all wire ones which I make up myself sometimes to amuse myself during the long winter evenings. Now, let's have a, a go at making these up. Those have got just standard snap swivel on them and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, made a couple of booms up for you. <clears throat> just the standard stuff. It's more about the technique than anything else and which lure you're using. So, let's see how close I can get. You can see the boom there. You can use those metal booms, wire booms, French booms, whatever type of boom you want. It's so that when you drop down, this is my real line, there my finger is, here's my fishing rod. It goes down to the seabed, hits the seabed. Away you start fishing. That's crooked for a start, Graham, God. Um, what happens is, You'd normally fish like this with a, say, 6, 8, 10 or 12 foot leader, way, way back here. I've made it two feet long just for the purpose of getting it in the camera. There's my regular lure. If you're out in a boat drif drifting in deep water, you drop it down to the bottom. It hits the seabed, reeling gear, two or three fast turns to get the lead out of any snags, and then nice, constant, steady winds. Fine, that's okay. So the particular spot I was fishing that day is shallow. So... You drop down, you have a very short space, right? How can I describe it? Let's say from the ceiling, the ceiling to here is 40 feet, 30 feet, whatever. That's imagine. Use your imagination. You want to be in the fish, down near the kelp, near the weed, near the snags, rocks. I'm going to say the bottom quarter or third of the water is where those pollock will be feeding. So if you're in deep water, you've got bigger structure, you've got more space to wind and retrieve, wind and retrieve vertically. When you're in shallow water, you don't have that option, do you? If you go up too high, you've got the, the lures in the boat. So you're working, continually working up and down in short areas, I'm going to say, just off there. So what I do is what I call deep trolling. It's exactly the same principle. There's the boom, the lead, the clip. Okay, my trace would be say 20 pounds, in this case it would be standard. A line comes six feet long, minimum I would say. Um, I don't use a long trace for this shallow inshore water fishing. Fish aren't that particularly spooky, you know, some people say, oh, I want a 20 foot trace. No, I don't bother with that. Um, generally, a span, peel the line off, good span like that, you'll find that's about six meet, six meters, six feet in real good old English language, or two meters and all that foreign stuff. So there you go, that's how the rig works. You drop it down and the boom stops your real line from tangling with your trace. You drop it down like that. That's why you have a boom at least, say, six, eight inches long. Fine, okay, you think, well, what are you doing there, Graham? I'm putting the boat, I used to do this a lot in pike fishing called float trolling. I used to put the boat in gear, just, just get it going along like this and I drag baits deeper. So what I do is I drop down to the seabed, wham, 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 wham four or five turns up, which will bring me over the kelp and the snags, right? But then I just close the reel off, hold it, put it in a rod holder, make sure you've got a strike drag on it. And the boat's action is gonna pull this along and he's gonna be like this, just swimming. Now the benefit of this is I am constantly in that kill zone. I'm constantly in it. 
because I've dropped down, hit the seabed, the kelp comes up, say, five feet off the bottom, I fish six, seven, eight feet, and that's where those bigger pollock are going to be. So I'm covering a lot more ground in the kill zone by doing, I'm calling it this, lateral deep water trolling. Or deep trolling, because it's shallow water, you said that, Graham. You got the gist of it anyway, guys. So drop it down, wind it. But, but, here's the problem. You would normally, with a red gill, drop down, hit the seabed, two or three fast turns to get your lead out of the snag. But, of course, the eel is unweighted. However, if you use a sidewinder, which is really good, especially in deep water, two principles apply. Not only do you hit the lead here, it goes on the seabed, you wind up, five turns. Well, that's great, but look, this is weighted. Clonk. You're just going to drag it straight to the seabed. So with these, you actually have to wind it a little bit higher to allow for the weight of here, the sidewinder, to sink down, if that makes sense. The other thing, if you're drifting with, let's say, argument's sake, like a, a two ounce lead, this isn't two ounces, I'm using this for the camera, a nice light lead up and down, as soon as you put the boat in gear, it's going to sweep it up too high. So if you do this lateral trolling, I love the sound of that, go for a slightly bigger lead to allow for the line not to come up so high. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And a tip for beginners is if you use small swivels, they might jam in the end here, just on the end. Here comes Mike, he's coming in. He's going to see my secret method now. I've got a, what I would call a standard swivel there. Here we go, he's going to copy my techniques. Watch this, he's going to read all about this. You want to put a bead because that and the knot can jam inside the boom there. Okay, so all you've got to do, pull it out. You do this when you rig up, obviously. I wonder if we go and make me another cup of tea. No comment. Uh, get yourself a plastic bead. If you just put this on, bear with me while I tie the knot. I'm take four or five days with my eyes. It's a very, very deadly technique, just honestly. Because what you're doing, you're in that kill zone for so long, you're basically deep water trolling. So, same principle, but you can see if you're using small swivels and a big entrance port there to the boom, you don't want the swivel jamming or the knot jamming in the end in there. Just put a bead on and that stops the boom jamming onto the swivel. Hopefully you can see that. And again, that doesn't really you know, occur too much if you have fixed wire booms because the end of the wire boom, I can't show you now. They won't believe it. Look, the fixed wire booms I make out of coat hanger wire, standard French boom, they've got, I just tie onto there and I, that will come up against the swivel so you're safe. But when you have tubes, tuby type booms like this, you need to put that stop on there. Finally, finally it's always a final, isn't it? So the main thing, the main point is with that lateral trolling is hit the deck, wind up six feet, eight feet, with a red gill. Maybe wind up the length of the trace a bit more, 10 feet maybe, with a sidewinder, because a sidewinder is still going to sink down being weighted, and you want it coming across the top of that weed bed. That's why we start to catch fish. You see, as soon as I, I change to that technique, I caught fish. The other thing, you might want to get yourself one of these little stones. No, no, we're not selling them. But they have a V cut in there. It's actually not a stone. This one's a steel. So you can work away and get bits of rust off if like me, you don't use them very often. You can get the rust off. I, I don't really touch the underneath more than a few strokes like this because it's very easy to take the point off. But with that groove, you can, I you see it that way, you can rub that hook point backwards and forwards in that groove and it does, it puts that, it puts a cutting edge on the back of it and that, ouch, that is sharp. Now, final tip is, with Pollock, and it's not so much the sidewinders, but with a red gill, if you get a few plucks, don't strike, just keep winding, it's standard procedure. If you do, and you get an, an eel that comes back with the tail bent round like that, that's because the Pollock comes up behind it, opens his mouth for suction to suck the eel back down, but all he does is suck this rubber part around the bend of the hook. He's pulled it like that, you've, you've definitely had a take. Make sure you straighten that red gill out like that. I mean, they are absolutely brilliant eel, these ones. Been around, and these are, they've got that curve, what's called a baffle tail. So you can pull these, and they love them, at a very, very slow speed. If I show you the difference between that and the sidewinder, can you see the curve there? Let's hold them dead still. See, it's slightly more curved, 
and it's got a sort of a scoop in there. So I like that for slow trolling, especially surface trolling for bass. Really good. Well guys, there's some tips there. Hopefully that'll help you understand how I was catching. I've got other films coming up on this lateral trolling. It's good for inshore small boat work. Generally, if you get a big charter boat that go over that shallow water, it ain't the same. They can hear the engine. Maybe there's six or eight anglers on them, all firing lines up and down. It does not work. You need a nice pair of lines and just work away slowly. If you've got an echo sound, even better, my God, you can fill up. Well, if we kept going all day, we were only there a few hours, we could have filled up. Right, next. Well, hopefully a few tips for beginners in there. Try that trolling, pulling the lure horizontally rather than vertically. It's a small boat deal, really. I enjoy doing it. I've always caught, done pretty well with it, really, especially pike as well. Anyway, don't tune off yet because there's something different coming. All you people who love their boats, and I'm one of them, I love small boats. How about making a canoe? Yeah, sounds good, doesn't it? Out of a tree. Guys, I know a lot of you people follow us with the fishing boats on the TA Fishing Show or anything boaty. So I'm here at Mike's, well, we show I'm helping him out, but I'm here to see Mark at New Haven Coppice. He's making a boat as well. You guys might be interested in it. It's not just any old boat. It's a boat made out of an enormous piece of forest. Let's see how Mark's getting on. So Mark, while you're chiseling and whittling away, yeah, give, us a, yeah. give us a rough idea, you know, what you're uh, intending to do over a period of three days <laughs> here at the Bushcraft Show. Uh, okay, so this is a, a lovely, knotty, gnarly old bit of lime that we've got brought up from Somerset. Um, and we're converting it over the course of um, three days into a canoe, a dugout canoe. Um, so this is the third canoe that I've done. But this one's going to be a bit special, a bit different, because we're going to, um, we're actually going to try and expand it. So uh, there was a tradition um, in the early kind of uh, Viking period and in the Iron Age um, and still present in Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania where they hollow out a log and then they light a big fire underneath it and they expand the top open to make a, a bigger canoe from a, from a smaller log so it's kind of a more efficient process of creating a more kind of graceful vessel than the kind of standard dugout canoe. Uh, design wise does this come off the piece at the front? So these are quite crucial actually. So you imagine when you were steaming this, um, this log later on, and hopefully tomorrow, um, we're going to be bending the sides out. Um, and there's a huge amount of force that's put on the grain. Um, and so these bits here will be clamped, clamped together with, uh, with wood, um, bound really tightly, and that will stop the whole log from splitting apart. Um, well, that's, that's the theory. So hopefully that will save us. I'm doing all this work and then ruining it at the last minute. Well, I did get shot of you yes, you're doing plenty of axe work to get the start yeah. of the shape. So your main one is to get the basic shape of what type of axes, you know, the names of the axes, you know, so people know what you start with. Yeah, yeah, well, most of the work um, uh, has been done with, yeah, just a, a, a normal kind of double beveled uh, uh, axe. And there's a few over there. Um, there's a Kent pattern that I've been using quite a lot of three and a half pound Kent axe. Um, but then, um, you know, each each different bit may require kind of slightly different axes. We've used a couple of side axes for um, shaping the kind of uh, the finer bits. Um, yeah, so here we go. <coughs> so this is just kind of a, a, a an old kind of a three and a half pound Nash. Uh, it's got a Kent pattern. It's kind of very characteristic. And this is really lovely for, for swinging, swinging all day long. It's not too heavy. Um, but it's got enough weight behind it that you can really chunk out the kind of waste wood. What weight would that be, yeah. the head? Three and a half pounds. Three and a half pounds, yeah. 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 So for some people it feels quite heavy, but yeah. um, really when you're swinging it down, you want that weight to kind of give it a bit of power. So that's, um, that's a lovely, lovely tool for, um, for, uh, for working the wood. Um, and then this is my little side axe. Um, so this is actually based on an early medieval axe. Um, it was made by a friend of mine in Devon called Dave Budd. Um, is that Dave of the Blacksmith that I that filmed is, previously? Yeah, 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 the world it. famous Dave Budd. That is the world famous the, the Dave knight, Budd. The knight blacksmith, I'm calling him. <laughs> he should be knighted. He's, he's an incredible guy, yeah. So he's an experimental archaeologist like me. He specialises in, in, in steel and, and metalworking. So anyway, he made this axe for me and I've, I've used it for the last uh, six or seven years now. Um, so it's kind of... Yeah, part of the part of the family. Um, yeah. So this was a really lovely axe to use, and um, has, has, has kind of proved proved very useful on this on this axe on this canoe. 
Um, what we um, we have been playing with as well, uh, being kind of the mad experimental archaeologists that we are. Um, oh wow! Uh, we, Flintstones. Yeah, exactly. So, so Flintstone had one of those. So this is a, a Neolithic axe made by Will Lord. Uh, he made the head. I just made the handle for it. Flint? Uh, is that? Yeah, it's flint. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I polished the edge. Just given that a polish by rubbing it on a on a bit of sandstone, and that kind of preserves the edge a bit better. So we use these in our woodland for um, bits of experimental archaeology and. Um, Yesterday, Tim had a go using it on this, and it, you know, it's surprising. It doesn't shatter. Efficient. I'm amazed it doesn't just shatter. Huh? No, absolutely not. So, yeah, by polishing that edge, you kind of preserve, preserve yeah. the kind of sh the strength and the shape of the of the tool. Um, and the shaft, what would that be? What, it's what, all what? ash. Yeah, it's all ash. ash. Yeah. So you want a really nice. That's why it looks a bit flintstoney because you can see how it wants to split yeah. the other end by having a really nice knotty bit there. It kind of keeps, oh stops the split running yeah, exactly. down the wood. Exactly. Oh yeah. wow. So, um, so anyway, last night uh, we had fun with our, our neighbours here and we were making bronze tools. Um, so we use bronze tools quite a bit. We've dropped big trees in our woodland with, with bronze tools. Um, so uh, this is just an early Bronze Age style axe. Um, we're going to give this a go later on, but also we're going to be handling the axe we made last night and be using that on, on, on the canoe as well. So that's later on, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so later so on. So now, is, I'm calling that spoke shave, but it you're, you're going to... Oh, it is a spoke yeah, shave. Yeah, yeah, so we've got a spoke shave. Yeah, yeah, Miranda. Those, my sessions at the secondary modern woodwork <laughs> class weren't totally wasted. <laughs> Absolutely, so we've been using a draw knife and a spoke shave just to um, get a nice smooth finish on the outside of the canoe. So obviously this is the underside. We'll be turning it over in a minute to start hollowing it out. Um, but we want a really nice curve here so that when we start steaming it, there's no kind of pressure point, no sharp angles where it might snap and, and crack. So um, there's going to be a lot of kind of, yeah. That's a laborious job. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it's very satisfying. Like the feel of the wood is absolutely yeah. lovely. Um, yeah, so that's the plan. Keep keep shaving it, keep shaping it. Um, and then, yeah, hollow it. In a minute, we'll be turning it over and starting to hollow it out where the hard work comes in again so this is a nice little relief this morning so it's, it's, it's big axe work again for the yeah, we'll be, oh, no, yeah, no, yeah. No. so we'll be using <laughs> using the axes but also using some adzes that I've had made up yeah. um, by my friend in Devon uh, Tom Toogood who runs Long Dog Smithy he'll be um, I rang him up on Monday and desperately asked him for a couple of adzes and he uh, he graciously made them for me at the last minute so um, we'll be using those to, to chip out the inside yeah that's the plan. Okay, yeah. Uh, you realise you're in big trouble, really. Why is that? Because your mother is going to be furious when she sees the mess you've made here. <laughs> well, I was actually, I was just saying to um, Susanna that actually she's offering to clear up, but we're going to be, the steaming process, we're going to need an enormous fire. So oh, really? we're going to be burning most of this, most of this wood. Um, Would you have to dig a fire pit for that? Yeah, yeah, we'll dig a long trench and yeah. we'll be filling this with water and then we'll be lighting a big fire to, um, to steam open. Oh yeah, here's, here's the ads. It hasn't quite been finished yet, but um, this will be uh, finished off, handled nicely, and then we'll be using this to, to, to hack out the inside. Brilliant. Well, we look forward to getting a picture of this when it's done. Yeah, 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 me too. <laughs> and plenty of plasters for the blisters, I should think. <laughs> There's going to be some blisters there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So at New Haven Coppice, we, um, we run woodland courses, um, but actually mostly we experiment with uh, uh, historical structures. So we build roundhouses and Anglo-Saxon long halls and, and uh, yeah, buildings from the past from museums and open air museums around the country. And that's our kind of day to day work, really. So it's courses, coursework with groups. Yeah. So, some courses, yeah. But as I said, most of my work is actually teaching volunteers how to use tools and then building structures at their sites. Got so we've just come back from Northumberland where we built an Anglo-Saxon and sunken sunken hut up there um, and at our own site we've got a couple of buildings there that we've made um, yeah so yeah Brilliant. that's a lot of work and a lot of chippings <laughs> I just hope when you light the fire it's blowing in the right direction yeah. <laughs> the campers behind you are going to be coughing yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs>
That was an unbelievable amount of work. Chopping, hacking, chewing away. I actually came back a day earlier from that show, uh, so I didn't actually get to see the finished canoe, but you can see they smoothed it all off and they were gonna turn it upside down. I think burn it out and steam it or whatever. Interesting stuff there. I find all that stuff, that old stuff interesting, the axes and saws and stuff. And it's traditional, once that information has gone, it's gone. Thanks for watching us this week. Don't forget, subscribe buttons, like buttons, hit that old like button. TA Fishing, TA Outdoors, and we'll see you in the next episode.